Micaiah, the son of Imlah, but I hate him, for he never prophesies good concerning me, but evil. I guess that's a good reason to hate somebody. <laughs> and Jehoshaphat said, let not the king say so. Then the king of Israel summoned an officer and said, bring quickly Micaiah, the son of Imlah. Now the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, were sitting on their thrones, arrayed in their robes at the threshing floor, at the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets were prophesying before them. And Zedekiah, the son of Kena, made for himself horns of iron and said, Thus says the Lord, With these you shall push the Syrians until they are destroyed. And all the prophets prophesied so and said, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and triumph. The Lord will give it into the hand of the king. And the messenger who went to summon Micaiah said to him, Behold, the words of the prophets with one accord are favorable to the king. Let your word be like the word of one of them and speak favorably. But Micaiah said, As the Lord lives, what the Lord says to me, that I will speak. And when he had come to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle or shall we refrain? And he answered him, Go up and triumph. The Lord will give it into the hand of the king. But the king said to him, How many times shall I make you swear that you speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? So I don't think we always get um, sarcasm when we're reading the Bible, but I'm guessing Micaiah said it with some sarcasm, right? Oh, go on up. Yeah, you'll have, you'll have victory. Go on. Because King Ahab clearly knew he was lying. Um, so then in verse 17, he says, Micaiah starts up again. He says, all right, fine. I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let each return to his home in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? And Micaiah said, Therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing beside him in his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab? And he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead. And one said one thing and another said another. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord saying, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, By what means? And he said, I will go out and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, you are to entice him and you shall succeed. Go out and do so. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these your prophets. The Lord has declared disaster for you. All right. So and then this chapter, it just, it goes on. We don't need to read the rest of it. It goes on to describe the battle in which King Ahab does in fact die. And um, King Jehoshaphat is, is fine, but God's a little mad at him for partnering up with him, but um, basically everything that was prophesied by Micaiah comes true. Now, I don't know about you guys, but uh, in verses 19 through 22, I mean, did you catch some of the kind of the weird vision going on there, right? Um, as I'm reading through, I'll give you a little glimpse into my sermon preparation. I'm, I'm reading the story of King Jehoshaphat, and I'm like, okay, yeah, there's kind of classic. Two kings are getting together. They're like, hey, God, should we go to war and, you know, get this, this land or whatever? And then some prophets come, and they're talking, and then all of a sudden, I'm like, reading verses 19 through 22, and I'm like, whoa, what's going on here? God is in the heavenly, in the heavenly courts, and he's asking these other presumably heavenly beings what he should do, right? There's some questions here. And so, actually, if we can go to the first slide, um, that, was, that was my face. At least in my mind, that was my face. So I don't know about you guys. I don't know if that was your face in your mind. I didn't see it on your visible faces. But if that was in your mind, then you probably have some of the same questions that I have, right? In verses 19 through 22. And, and so what I want to do is I want to unpack this vision a little bit. Um, and I want to lay a little bit of groundwork so that we can kind of understand it as best we can. And then I want to go and I want to look at some other scriptures that can help us answer some of the questions. What's, what's going on here? God's conversing with these divine beings, and one of them has one plan, God doesn't like it. And then one of them has a plan that God apparently likes, and God's like, all right, fine, yeah, go ahead and do it. Kind of just a weird story, right? So let's unpack it a little bit. Verse 19, and Micaiah said, therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing beside him and on his right hand and on his left. So in Micaiah's vision, the first thing that we see is we see God sitting on his throne. So we, we know who God is, right? And then it says there's a host of heaven on his right and on his left. Um, now, some people say, oh, well, that could mean like um, good, like divine beings on, on the right side and then bad ones on the left. Uh, but either way, it's described as a host of heaven. So we don't know exactly what they are. They they could be angels, they could be demons, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't exactly say, so we don't know, but it's, it's a host of heaven. Um, by the grouping's name, we can deduce that they're not humans, right? 
Then in verse 20, going on, it says, And the Lord said, Who will entice Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said one thing, and one said another. Then his spirit came forward and stood before the Lord, saying, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, By what means? And he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of his prophets. And he said, You are to entice him, and you shall succeed. Go out and do so. So uh, then we see God propose a question to this host, right? This, this heavenly host. Kind of strange, right? God, God has clearly decided something, right? He's decided that King Ahab, it's time for him to be punished. He's tired of King Ahab's wickedness, and so God has decided that King Ahab will be punished. And he's sitting there, he calls his heavenly host around him, and he says, hey, how, how should we entice him to go up to Ramoth Gilead so that he'll die in battle as punishment for his sins? And one spirit comes up and says one thing. God's like, eh, good, but what else we got? Another one comes up and says another. And then finally one comes up and gives a plan that God likes, right? And then uh, God clearly likes the plan. And so he, he gives the spirit as it's uh, described. It's described as a spirit. And he says, all right, yeah, you'll succeed. Go out and do so. And then the rest of the story is, is just an explanation of what happens as a result of this heavenly encounter that Micaiah the prophet was privy to. So kind of a, 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 weird, a weird thing going on here. And, and I would imagine a lot of you probably haven't read this passage, or, or maybe if you have, maybe you just kind of read through, you were doing like a Bible reading plan, and you're like, all right, got to plug through the, you know, the Old Testament you know, stories, right? And so you're just kind of powering through and maybe not really dwelling on what, what exactly is going on here. Who are these spirits? Who are, is this heavenly host? Um, and so I'll just tell you some of my questions when I'm reading the passage. Who are these heavenly beings? Who is the heavenly host? Um, how often does this sort of thing happen, right? How, long do, how often does something like this happen where uh, God converses with heavenly beings, not humans, right, and, and asks them, how should we do something? Or, or says, hey, do you have an idea of how we can further one of my purposes, right? How often does that happen? Does it happen a lot? Is it just this time? Um, another question I have is, are there other examples in Scripture where this sort of thing does happen? And then lastly, and, and I think that when we get to this kind of question, we'll, we'll get a little bit of practical application um, out of it, but um, what do we learn about God in this passage that can help us to understand him better, understand him more? Um, and so I think some of these questions we can answer pretty well from a biblical perspective um, without just guessing, you know, what, uh, on some of these questions. Um, but what I want to do now is I want to look at some scriptures that can give us some context to understand, um, to then come back to um, our passage and understand what's happening. Um, so if you go to the next slide, Grant. Um, so before we get started with that, I want to kind of give some credit where credit is due. Uh, this book, it's called The Unseen Realm by Michael Heiser. Um, he's one of those guys that has like more uh, degrees than you know how to pronounce. Um, but a, a, lot of, a lot of what I'll be talking about is, is kind of some summary or some things that I got from this book. Um, now, some of you are probably looking at it and you're like, ooh, that's a little hokey, Nathaniel. The unseen realm. Woo! Like, what's, what's that about, huh? You going off the deep end here? Um, <laughs> this book is actually... It, 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 it has some things that, when I was reading through, that I had never thought of before. Um, but it, it's not, he's not some Wild West cowboy theologian just charging off, you know, interpreting scripture however he wants. Um, he does have some of the, uh, his book has a recommendation of some of the, the most widely accepted uh, biblical theologians of today. And so he's not just kind of a, a, lone, a lone cowboy doing what he wants and everybody else is like, whoa, whoa man, calm down. Um, but if you want to go deeper than kind of what I'll talk about in this sermon, I would highly recommend this book. Um, so the first passage I want to look at tonight is Psalm chapter 82. I think it's in the U version, um, but if you want to flip there in your Bible, you can. I've got it up on the screen. So uh, I'll read these six verses really quick. It says, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. How long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods, sons of the most high, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. 
So at first glance, and at its very base level, what this passage is about is the, is the psalmist is crying out to God and saying, God, come down and, and judge rightly. Bring your justice to earth and, and rescue those who are afflicted. Bring your righteousness. Bring your justice. Um, but deeper in, and specifically relating to our passage in 1 Kings, I, I want us to notice the language in verse 1. God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. So that first verse, it kind of sounds a little similar to what we had in 1 Kings, right? A divine council. God is with a divine council of divine beings, and he's, he's holding judgment, right? It kind of sounds a little bit similar here. Now, what's a little bit strange is, is when you look at uh, the word for God. Um, the word for God, many of you guys have heard the word Elohim, right? To describe God, Elohim. Uh, Most high Elohim, or God, Elohim. Um, but what gets kind of weird is in verse 1, it, that, that word Elohim is used twice. It says, God, Elohim, has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, or in the midst of the Elohims, he, takes, he holds judgment. Now, that's a little strange, right? But if we know that Scripture doesn't contradict itself, what do we know? We know that there's no God like our God, right? There's verses and passages that say that. We know that there's passages that say, uh, God is the most high God. There is no one like him. So if the word Elohim is used only exclusively as like a proper title to God, then this would be kind of a contradiction, right? It says, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. And so we know kind of just at least on first glance that this word Elohim is probably less of a direct title to God and probably more of a general category. Um, and so Elohim, we know it, it, it means something slightly different um, because we know from the rest of Scripture that there's no God like God. Then in verse 6, it kind of enhances it a little bit more. It's God pronouncing judgment on these other Elohim, these other gods. He says, I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. So not only is there a distinction between God, capital G, God, and these other beings that are described as Elohim. But then there's also a distinction in verse 6 between these other beings uh, and humans, right? Because God, in pronouncing his judgment on these other beings, is saying, you will die like men. And so we know that this distinction of Elohim is not about a human, um, but it's not just about God. So before I want to go any further, I want to show you a couple other passages in Scripture that use the word Elohim in various ways. And so if you pull up that next slide here. Um, so the first one, Deuteronomy chapter 435, and you might know the Lord is God. So that, that God is Elohim. So it's talking about Yahweh God. Um, the second one is, is ours right here in the midst of the gods. Um, it's talking about divine council members, um, whatever that is. We don't know exactly what that is yet, but in the midst of the gods, he holds judgment and his divine council. Um, so it's describing other divine beings. And then the next one is in 1 Kings 11. Because they have forsaken me and worshiped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Assyrians. Um, goddess is the word Elohim, gods and goddesses of other nations. Uh, and the woman said to Saul, I see a god coming up out of the earth. That's when Saul went to um, a, a witch to, to bring back the spirit of Samuel. And, and when Samuel actually did come back, another strange story. Um, that She says, oh, I see a god coming up out of the earth. So the word, she used the word Elohim. And then another one in Deuteronomy 32, they sacrificed to demons that were no gods, to gods they had never known, to new gods that had come recently. And so also we see the Hebrew writers using the word Elohim to describe uh, demons and other gods. And so what I want to state really clearly here at this point is, is that Elohim is a term of residence, not a proper name of God. It's a term of residence. Um, it would be similar to saying maybe like earthling, Right? Or maybe something a little bit more sophisticated that doesn't conjure up in our minds little green aliens saying earthlings when talking about humans, right? Um, but as we've seen from Scripture, the, the word Elohim can refer to a number of divine beings, simply things that are not human, beings that are not human, beings that are not of this world. Uh, but it, it can also refer to God as well because he is a divine being who is not a human. And so let's look at some other scripture where the word Elohim refers to God. Next one. Okay, Exodus 15. Who is like you among the gods, Yahweh? 
What God is there in the heaven or on the earth who can do according to your works and according to your mighty deeds? O Yahweh, God of Israel, there's no God like you in the heavens above or the earth beneath. For you, O Yahweh, are most high over all the earth. You are highly exalted above all the gods. And so you see here in these passages when the Hebrew writers are are referencing God, uppercase G, uh, they're making a distinction, right? They're saying, there's no other God like you. They're saying there's no other Elohim like you, God. An easy way for us to kind of understand what they're saying is, basically they're saying there's no other divine being like you, God, in earth or on heaven, in the heavens above or the earth beneath. Now, when they're talking about that, when the Hebrew writers are saying these things, if, you know, a lot of times when we think of like Old Testament idols, right, and we think of them as just that, just idols that are just, you know, a stone carving, right? Would a Hebrew writer who knows who God is and respects his power and his awesomeness and his authority and his ability to create, would, would you cr- compare God to a rock? Hey, God, there's no other God like you. You're so much better than these rocks. It's kind of like, does that really even need to be stated? And so what we see here is that the word Elohim just means divine being. And then when the Hebrew writers use the word Elohim to describe God, there's something descriptive either in the language or in the context around it to let us know that we're talking about God, most high God, Yahweh, God. And so another thing I want to state really clearly at this point is that um, Elohim, again, it's, it, it's a term kind of of residence, not just a proper name of God. And now you might be saying, okay, Nathaniel, where are we at right now? You've gone way crazy. Where, where, how does this even apply? Well, I want to show you some passages uh, that, that help us to develop a framework for the passage that we just read in, in 1 Kings so we can understand what's, what's happening, what is happening in this maybe divine council, right? In Psalm 82, when it talks about God sitting in the divine council, it, that's kind of similar to what we read in, in 1 Kings. God is sitting with the divine council. And so an easy way for me to understand the word Elohim is just to understand it as divine being. Another thing I want to mention here is that the Old Testament writers, they were not uh, monotheists. They, they did not believe in many gods like the Greek pantheon. Uh, and basically what that means is, is they didn't believe that some other divine being could best God at any point, or some other divine being could usurp God's power or best him in any way, shape, or form. Um, it's not like Hercules, you know, taking on some other god or half-god or something like that. Um, and so this is why the Old Testament writers so many times would say things like, who are you, or who is like you among the gods? And so all throughout Scripture, we see Yahweh God is attributed these unique attributes with unique power. Um, One example for me that helped me kind of understand this concept of Elohim being uh, able to uh, refer to God but also other things is uh, if you if you think about like people in government, there's a lot of people in government, right? Um, And 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 you could say, oh, this person is in government, but they could be in different places, right? And the president, there's only one president in government, but the president could also be described as somebody who is in government. But then there's still only one president. He's, the president is unique in his power and his position and his authority, right? And so, but then the president is, not, uh, is also still unique, though he is in that kind of category, right? And so in the same way, God is a divine being. There are other divine beings, as we've seen in Scripture, Right, and we understand that too with angels, demons, right? Satan or the archangel Michael, something like that. Um, God is a divine being. There are other divine beings, but God is have term limits. So, so at this point, you might be thinking, "All right, Nathaniel, you're kind of you, you're losing me, or I'm not sure exactly what you're saying." Um, I have prepared this study really carefully because I, I know I'm presenting some information that might be a little bit new. If I said something that that seems a little bit inconsistent or something that just made you more confused than when you came in here, please come and talk to me afterwards. Um, I understand that you may have some questions in your mind that I'm not answering. Um, But another question you may have is, okay, why did I go into all of this? Why is is this important to our passage in 1 Kings? Um, Well, first of all, I I believe in in Timothy when Paul says that all scripture is God-breathed. It's useful for teaching, right? 
All scripture is God breathed. And so if we believe that all scripture is important, that it's all God's word, and that God specifically designed scripture to have things in it and not have things in it, then we need to do our best to understand everything. And, and, and we shouldn't be scared away by scripture, right? If we read a passage in scripture that we're like, whoa, this, this is confusing, or does this maybe challenge some of the things that I've, I've kind of thought, or, or how do I take this and put it into other passages? Um, we, I don't think we need to be scared of Scripture, and I think that God put it there for a reason, and so I think we can do our best to understand it. And I also believe that uh, this kind of background is crucial to understanding what's happening in 1 Kings, and then it's crucial to us understanding how God uses us as well. Um, there's a lot of other passages, but I just want to reference one more. Um, the, the book of Job sheds a lot of light on this kind of this, uh, this context, but I, I just want to look at one uh, one verse in, in the book of Job. Uh, it's a pretty p- common one. You guys have probably all read it. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Sounds kind of like First Kings and, and Psalm 82, right? And Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth, from walking up and down on it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man who fears God and turns away from evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions, have increased in the land, but stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your hand, only against him do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So this is a pretty similar situation to both what we see in Psalm 82 and our passage in 1 Kings. At the beginning of Job, we see this encounter where it it describes the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And we know that Satan's not a human, right? So it's kind of similar. Maybe this is also God's divine counsel. But the sons of God came to present themselves. God questions them. God talks to them. God makes a decree and then they follow through with it. Kind of an interesting, similar uh, scenario. So God summons a divine host before him. He decrees something, and then a divine being goes and does according to what God says. So I want to take a a quick moment and summarize kind of where we've gone and then what we have talked about so far. Um, God is the most high God. There is no one like him. I don't want that to be any sort of confusion. Uh, God is the most high Elohim. He is the most high divine being. As the Hebrew writer stated, he is the most high being in heaven and all, and all of heaven and all of earth. Um, there are other Elohim. There are other divine beings who are part of God's divine counsel as described in Psalm 82 and that we saw like there in, in Job chapter one and then also in 1 Kings chapter 22. Some of these divine beings may be good and some may be bad, right? We understand that. There's, there's demons and there's angels. We understand there's good and bad. And lastly, we understand that God uses these divine beings to carry out his decrees, like we see in this passage and also in 1 Kings chapter 22. And so this is where we kind of want to bring it all back together. One final question that you guys kind of may have is, is you're like, okay, I, I understand that God has this divine counsel, and I don't understand much about it, and I don't either. <laughs> I'm just going off the scripture that we see here. But God has this divine counsel that we've seen, Right? God uses them to do certain work, right? We've seen that a couple times. And so we might ask the question, why does God need this heavenly host of divine beings to do his work, right? I mean, it's a valid question. Um, And actually, it's a really similar question to one that we ask a lot more often. One that we ask a lot more often is, why does God need us to fulfill his work on earth, right? It's another valid question. Why does God need us to do anything? Well, the, the answer is really the same for both. He, he doesn't need us, but he chooses to use us. We don't always know why God chooses to use us, but he has. The same way God doesn't need a divine uh, counsel. He doesn't need to summon the, the sons of God before him. He doesn't need a, a heavenly host before him to do his bidding, but he chooses to work through them, much like he chooses to work through us. And I think we see this quite clearly when we go back to our passage in 1 Kings 22. When Micaiah says, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne and all the host of heaven, verse 19, standing beside him on his right and on his left. 
And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? One said one thing, one said another and another. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord saying, I will entice him. And the Lord said to him, by what means? And he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, you are to entice him and you shall succeed. Go out and do so. So essentially God decreed that Ahab, his time was up. He used to be put to death. But he left the, the means of that decree up to this heavenly host, right? There were a couple, couple different things that were apparently suggested that, that God passed on, and then one said, hey, how about this? And God said, I like that idea. Go and do it. You will succeed. So he left it up to his free will imagers to make decisions to accomplish his will. God decreed the end, but the means were left up to the imagers. And this kind of, you know, could delve into the debate of a little bit of God's sovereignty versus free will. And, um, you know, I, I really, that, that, that whole debate, I think, gets us a little bit more off track than, than anything else sometimes. When we talk about, you know, God using free will agents, right? And, and we talk about, well, how could God be sovereign if we have free will? And, or how could we have free will if God is sovereign? And um, a lot of times the whole conversation of, of those two things makes us think that the two are mutually exclusive or that, somehow God couldn't be sovereign if we had free will, or that somehow God couldn't be sovereign and in control if he allows this heavenly host or the divine council to do things kind of as they will, to follow his, his, um, his decrees and to fulfill his purposes. When in fact, I think God deals with us much in the same way that we see him interact with the divine council. God has a decree. He's decreed an end. God has a plan. He has a purpose that is going to be achieved, but he uses us to do that sometimes, right? Sometimes he says, this is what I want to happen, and we are the ones who, who fulfill it. Now, of course, we know that God doesn't need us to do anything. Uh, one of the verses in the Bible, I didn't write down the reference, but it talks about how if there's nobody to worship him, the rocks will cry out and worship God, right? God doesn't need us to worship him, but he chooses us to fulfill his purposes. He chooses us to, to fulfill his decrees, and to freely choose how to accomplish those tasks. So here's a question I kind of want to leave you all with tonight. Back to our story in 1 Kings, right? Remember the context is Jehoshaphat and Ahab, both kings of Israel. God wanted, probably wanted to use both of them for good things, right? Jehoshaphat was good. One of the things that he's actually known for is turning the hearts of, of Israel, the, the people away from worship of the Baals and back to God. Ahab was exactly the opposite. He worshiped Baal. He brought everybody with him. And so I want to kind of ask you guys, how are you using the things that God has given you? How are you using your free will? How are you using, what, how are you using your time and your resources to fulfill God's decrees, to fulfill God's purposes? Are you King Ahab or are you King Jehoshaphat? Which king are you? Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Guys, we have a choice to follow God or not. Every day you wake up, you have a multitude of choices. Are you going to follow God or, or not? And my friends, isn't it amazing that God wants us to follow him, that he wants our assistance? Again, don't, don't hear me wrong, not because he needs our assistance, but because he wants to work in us, because he wants to work through us. And we see that in this passage in, in 1 Kings, and I think that God deals with us in much the same way. That we can be of genuine assistance to the decreed purpose of the creator of the heavens and the earth, the most high God who's created everything. He has a decreed end, and he wants us to fulfill those purposes. Not because he needs us, but because he wants to use us. And so which king will you be? As we uh, pray and, pl and, and have our last song, we will have a prayer team in the back. If you want prayer for anything, I encourage you to take advantage of that. Uh, but let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we come to you now, and, and Lord, we're humbled by your word. God, we understand that there are uh, mysteries in your word and mysteries of who you are that we may never fully understand, God. But we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the, the things that you have put in your word and that you have left and that you have preserved for us to, to have so that we can know more about you. And so we can know and not only how to be saved, but we can know how to follow you 
and how you want to work in us and work through us. God, as we go out from today and we have the rest of the semester here, I pray that we would use what you have given us to follow you and to to pursue your purposes, to pursue your decrees. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.